So, um, you guys know I read a lot, and so on and so forth, and um, I don't know how to approach this subject. I had it all laid out how I was going to present this because it's gonna be something hard for us to swallow, but sometimes we like to read scripture in the light of our own culture, right? Um, Another way to put this. Because of the culture that we live in, when we read scripture, sometimes we make stuff up and we inject things inside of scripture that aren't there originally, and we miss things that the narrative meant for us to see because they don't really apply to, uh, to, to our culture. Um, a great example of this that we'll be going into next week uh, is King David with Bathsheba, right? Um, we see so many different things that we're like, we're in our culture, that's sin, and we could identify this, what David did here and here and here and here is all these different types of sins. Uh, in reality, um, the narrative never really specifies that he did all these sins. The biggest sin he did was covering another man's wife. That was really it, and we're gonna discuss that next week, but because we live in a westernized culture, we tend to identify things that are sensitive to our culture, and we inject them into scripture. And guys, scripture, was written for you, right? Bible was written for you, but it was not written to you. Everybody understand that? Um, Our culture, the mindset that we have in the West, uh, our individualistic culture, didn't really exist 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Uh, So when the authors uh, of the biblical text were writing, they were writing to a specific culture, and we're gonna speak about that today some differences, some things that maybe we've never realized before. Um, hey, did you guys realize, uh, I think it's in, in Japan, Japanese culture, it's polite to sip your soup. Did you realize that? That's what I've heard. It means that you're, uh, what, you're really enjoying your meal or something along those lines. Polite, but in, in our country, it's very rude to slurp your food. I wanted to make this statement because I love to slurp and Jenny gets onto me a lot. And regardless, just these subtle differences. So I have a question for you guys. What if every school in the US had mandatory uniforms for their students? Everyone's looking at me. This doesn't seem like a biblically based question. What if? How would that make you feel, parents? Your kids have to wear this uniform. What if you don't like the uniform? What if you don't like the uniform? How would your kids feel about it? You don't have a choice. You can't send your, skid, your kids to school with the new outfit that you just bought them. They have to wear this. So some anecdotal evidence suggests that when students all wear the same uniform, it reduces bullying and other violence against students, increases academic performance because they're not all concerned about what they're wearing and how they appear to others, and generally make the school safer because it makes it easier to identify intruders, right? In America, we argue that, I've heard the argument that this limits a student's free choice, hinders their First Amendment right of free expression and is an affront to American core values. As an American, would you agree with that? No. No, everybody's like, no, wow. In the US, many would argue that maintaining a free choice is better than safety or education. How about that? Ah. We're starting, we're starting to scrounge up our libertarian roots, right? <laughs> that exist in both political parties. Is free choice a higher priority than education and safety? Yes. They're married, guys. <laughs> Absolutely. That's who we're 18. We have that mindset because of a little thing called the, the American Revolution, <laughs> the Revolutionary War, right? We're independent, right? Give me liberty or give me death, right? And that's what we're instilled with in American culture. And so many would argue, and I've heard the arguments that if every student was required, required by law to wear an identical uniform, that, that's, that's kind of going against what we believe. We believe in individualistic choices. We believe in standing out. We believe in being an overachiever, right? Do what? It's gonna be an individual choice to have to go to that school. Uh, all schools. Blanket. 
has to wear that tie every single day. <laughs> we know in, in Chinese and in, uh, Eastern culture, um, Japanese culture, majority of schools wear uniforms. Majority, not all of them. Uh, but the majority of public schools in Japan have uniform codes. And for the reasons that's lifted above, conformity. Everyone is equal. Everyone is part of the same community. And this is known as a collective culture. And I know you guys, a couple months ago, we briefly went over the difference between an, an individualistic and a collective community or collective culture. But in America, in the West, as a blanket statement would be, we're known as what's called an individualistic culture, which means we focus on me, my, and I. <laughs> me. We focus on individuals because we're individual. All of our priorities, everything we do is based on our perception of the community, whereas in the East, it's collectivistic, it's a collective effort. Everything you do is for the betterment and harmony of your community and your society. Totally against all American core values, right? So in collectivistic cultures, family, community, tribe, and country come first, okay? The goal here is to support harmony and community as a whole. Okay, um, in, in, uh, in, in some Eastern uh, faiths, we have with the yin and yang, right? And it's supposed to be like a positive and a negative forces that are in harmony with each other, you see. It's all about maintaining a balance in the community, in society, and in culture. And so everything we do is for the betterment of all people, not just us, whereas, oh, maybe I have more slides. <laughs> and cholesterol, oh, I lost my time. The goal of living in a society like that is to override any type of self-interest. Because as soon as you focus on you, everybody within your family is now lessened as a priority. Well, what if my family is a priority? What's your priority? What about someone else's family? What about someone else's community? So on and so forth. One's identity does not come distinguished or does not come distinguishing his or herself from the community, but understanding and fulfilling his or her role in the said community. In other words, if you were part of a tribe 3,000 years ago, your role would be distinguished by the family you were born into. You wouldn't go outside that role, okay? You were born a Hittite, you're gonna stay a Hittite and you're gonna keep Hittite values for the betterment of the Hittite community. No, I wanna, I wanna do off and do, do this belief system. I wanna set a new standard. No, you won't. That is your role. You do not define your own role in life. Whereas in America, what do we say? What do we teach our children? Be a go-getter, excel. Stay apart from the team, right? Be set apart from the rest of the world. Stick out. And that's how you're gonna excel. In the East, they don't do that. <laughs> you blend in you blend in and you become part of the driving force of the larger family that we're a part of. I'm going somewhere with all this. There are many sayings in Asian culture to display this point. Um, we were watching one of those uh, race car movies, Fast and Furious, and it was taking place in Japan the other day. And they actually quoted one of these things and I was like, wow, and I totally saw the way collectivistic cultures work just based on this movie. So one of the sayings in, in, in Asian culture is the tallest blade of grass gets cut first. Right? It makes sense, right? These are, these, are, these are proverbs of the East. Right? How about the nail that sticks out gets hammered? The loudest duck gets shot first. <laughs> yeah, but we're supposed to stick out. We're supposed to grow above everyone else. We're supposed to be independent and fly away from the pack. Not in non-Western cultures. Now, I'm not saying what we teach our children is wrong or bad in any way, but I wanna try to paint a picture or at least create a scope of the culture that scripture was written in. Because what if scripture was written in a, to a collectivistic culture where the focus was not on I, but on us? Where the focus was on furthering the community, the kingdom, not my household? What if it wasn't written to an individualistic audience. And how would scripture appear if an individualistic audience read scripture thinking it was written to their culture? 
we might get some things wrong. In individualistic cultures, we choose who we marry. That's our right, Dagnabbit, right? Right? It's our decision, it's our future. It is what we want. It's because I love them. I love him or her, right? I, 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 it's my decision, right? In collectivistic cultures, arranged marriages are very, very, very popular. Now think about this. Parents, how many of you would like to arrange your marriages for your daughters and sons? Look at that. <laughs> Look at that. Do you, think, do you think if your daughters and sons, if teenagers were in here with you, do you think they'd raise their hand? Yeah, I'd like that. You raise your hand probably because of wisdom. <laughs> do, you th- do you think you know what's better? Do you think you know what's best for your children? Yes. In non-Western cultures, that's the idea. As with any important decision, the community should decide what is best for a young individual. You see, marriage is not simply a covenant between two people in non-Western cultures. It's actually a covenant between two families. Two families are going to come together, be married together. They're not gonna be able to shake one another off. Therefore, how could you leave that decision up to a teenager or a 22, 23 year old? How calloused are you that you would leave the decision of, of who to marry up to your young son or daughter? Shame on you. <laughs> Poor kid. It's a big decision. Hope he doesn't make the wrong one. And so in non Western cultures, we see the idea around arranged marriages and we see why it's accepted because it seems like a good idea when you put it in that light and in culture, right? because it's about something bigger than just an individual or two individuals getting married. It affects everybody. We do have a few um, collectivistic divisions in our nation. One is sports, right? Because we play sports, typically it's not a one-on-one, right? Typically, you have teams, right? And so a player is expected to lay down his or her own personal interests and desires to succeed in a team or for the success of the team as a whole, right? That's why we play sports. But then we as America, we always like to throw in the little special MVP award for most valuable player, right? So you can, you're gonna play as a team. You're gonna play as a team, but we still want you to be an individual within the team. We want you to stick out so that you're the MVP, the most valuable player. Okay, well, that's okay. We have another division. It's, a, it's a, the military, right? Right? Collectivistic efforts, right? Collective effort. It's no I in military, right? And so we have uh, the military fighting alongside your fellow Americans to defend the betterment of the nation, not yourself, right? Not yourself. It's a collective effort. It has to be. You can't have an individualistic military. But how do you advertise to an individualistic nation to join a collective effort? 1980s, it started in the 1980s with the military campaign of um, be all you can be in the army, right? And then around 2001, they switched the campaign to an army of one. (laughs) Army of one. Why? Because as an individualistic nation, culture, if you will, (laughs) join the army, be equal, and move our force forward as an equal part of the chain doesn't really appeal to us. (laughs) Army of one, darn right. I want to be an army of one. I want to be all I can be in the army. And then they've kind of blurred the lines a little bit with their most recent campaign, Army Strong. That's the big one now. Army Strong, be Army Strong. And so it can kind of go both ways. But you see, I've never noticed that before. Hmm. Conformity is a vice in our culture. It's looked down upon to be irregular, to blend in, to be part of the crowd. It indicates a weak mind that is not willing to stand out. Anyone else agree with that? Everyone's scared to raise their hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. darn right. (laughs) We see conforming as a sign of weakness and immaturity. We have sayings, right? When uh, when you refuse to be independent from your family, come on, man, cut the cord. (laughs) Fly the nest. See how we reinforce this in our general culture. We thrive to support independence and self-reliance as a pin of pride. I stick out. I stand out. That's true. It comes from our nation's history. 
we will stand out, we will rebel against the powers that want us to conform. Non-Westerners often consider an individualist as one who breaks harmony as self-important or one that does not belong, doesn't blend in. It's a negative attribute to stick out. You're gonna get hammered. <laughs> Can you imagine? I was watching a documentary this morning actually on YouTube, National Geographic, um, that filmed these, uh, these, these uh, immigrants from Sudan as they came to the United States and, and they were talking, very, sounded very educated um, in their accent. Yes, I've never used electricity, a 30-year-old. I've never used electricity. I don't know what I'm gonna do in America. You know, I've never been to America. I don't know what this means. I don't know how to do this. Um, and so when they get here, they start experiencing America. And of course, you know, there's about 15 of these guys that come and they, they have a house, they have an apartment. Um, and every time they leave, they travel together, right? And people started calling the cops on them because, you know, you have, you know, Pittsburgh, group of 15, oh, they're not African Americans, they're Africans, right? Sudanese men walking around, black men walking around, people call, calling the cops. Store owners get intimidated because they all walk in the store at one time. <gasps> and so the cameras, after they've been here for about six months, they start talking to the guys, what do you think of America? It's a very strange place, very strange place. You see, in America, nobody talks to you. In the park, we walk, and nobody is friendly. Everybody walks alone. And if they walk past you in the park, you would think they would be lonely, but no, they don't want to talk to you. They look down. They look away. The police actually told them to start breaking it up whenever they walk into local stores to only go in at three or four at a time, diversify. One of the things that they said, it cracked me up, they said on the camera, they said, uh, yes, if you, if you walk into a, a stranger's house, people call the police on you. He's like, in Sudan, we don't do that. We say, are you lost? Do you need help? Do you need a place to stay? Do you need to? Because it's a community. Just because it's my house doesn't mean it's private. Collectivistic versus individualistic. Uh, I'm reading a book right now that's written by some, some missionaries who went to Indonesia. Hilarious stories. No privacy. No privacy. So same thing, you have your house where your bed is, but people walk in and out all the time. He's, talking, he's staying in this house and he wakes up and there's strangers in his room. Who are you? Just hanging out. Just, that's what the community does. We hang out with each other and we just walk into someone's house, not stealing anything, there's no ill will, but that the doors are always open. And so there's literally no privacy. It makes counseling very, very difficult, <laughs> he said. <laughs> Try to counsel someone in private matters that everyone already knows about it and it, it's just... We can't imagine a world like that. The Sudan, uh, some of the Sudanese men, they looked at the camera and they said, it's, what a shame this America is. What a shame. Never used electricity in their life, trying to learn how to drive. First tasted a potato chip when they moved in their apartment. The guy on the camera man showing them, look, these are potatoes. And they hold the potato, the bag of potato chips. They chop them up, they fry them, look, and they eat them, this is really good. Six months later, what a shame this place is. We thought it would be better. Now we come to the Bible. Anyone know what that is? It's a baby Jesus right there. And we got Mary, and we got Joseph. I don't know who this guy, I guess he's a shepherd. He's one of the shepherds. And then we got the three wise men, which never states there's three wise men. The drummer boy's somewhere. What are they in? What's that called? A stall? The stall, right? The nativity scene. I want to see that stall there because the one thing about the nativity, the one thing we, we, we the typical story of, of, of how Yeshua was born is that Mary and Joseph, um, for whatever reason, it's debatable, but scripture says they, they need to be taxed and every man need to return to his own town. And so Mary and Joseph set out by their lonesome, all by themselves, to travel from Nazareth all the way down or up to Bethlehem. And we see them struggling in the movies and they're struggling along and they're traveling to Bethlehem. And as soon as they arrive in Bethlehem, I mean, right as they cross over the border, Mary grabs her belly. Oh no, it's coming. <laughs> so Joseph freaks out. And what's he do? He runs to the inn, the hotel, and he bangs on the door. My wife's gonna give birth, right? 
We know that hosp- uh, hospitality was one of the main cores of Eastern, uh, Eastern culture, but that's just disregarded in the Western world. The, the innkeeper was like, no, there's no room for, here for you, but listen, there's a shack out back where the animals are. You go there, right? Everyone with me? This is what I was taught, right? Group in Sunday school, we see it in the movies. And so they slam the door in Joseph and Mary's uh, face and they walk around back and there's a bunch of animals and like a stall and there's a manger in there and they have the child in there all alone until the shepherds come. And then depending, you know, some movies depict the wise men coming a couple years later, others just, they show up out of nowhere. (laughs) Poof, gifts. (laughs) Scripture never says really any of that, guys. Scripture never says he was born in a stall. Um, Justin of the third century states that he was born in a cave outside the gates of Bethlehem. Um, we see a lot of movies trying to adapt that and then being in a cave that was a stall. That's, that's been kind of debunked recently by, by a lot of scholars. They think he was, he was trying to make a connection that wasn't there. But something that modern day scholars and biblicalarchaeology.com actually reinforces this well, let's just read it. I'm sorry, guys. So, so Luke 2, you guys realize that Luke is the only gospel that actually states this story? I mean, Matthew talks about he was born in Bethlehem. I said, no details about an inn, none of that, right? So starting in Luke chapter 2, and it came to pass that in those days there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. That's what I'd do. And this taxing was first made by Serenius who was the governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city, okay? And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of? So he went back to his family home, while all his family lived, right? Mary, same way, lineage, David. Never thought about that. Going back to the hometown where all of your ancestors are, all of your extended family. Hmm. So they went to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. So she was pretty pregnant. <laughs> and so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered, or that she should deliver the baby. Anyone ever noticed that verse before? While they were there, the days leading up to her pregnancy finally were accomplished. They could have been there for a little while. It wasn't like overnight. It was while they were there. So they went to Bethlehem, and while they were there, she finally finished her pregnancy, and she needed to give birth. So here we go, verse seven, big verse. Verse seven is how we get the entire nativity scene of what we view in the Western world. You ready? And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Matt, that's exactly what it says. You're, what's wrong with that? You guys know what a manger is? I was always growing up thinking a manger because I'm not a farmer. I don't keep cattle or anything. I thought a manger was like the barn, right? I thought that was the whole barn. That was the shed. That was everything, the whole structure. A manger is just a trough. It's what the, 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 you put feed in for the cattle to eat out of. That's it. Nowhere does this indicate it was in a barn or cave or shelter or anything, okay? Could have been, but he was laid in a manger. Laid in a manger. So we automatically assume if there was a manger there, it had to have been a shelter or a cave or somewhere all the cattle went, right? And, and that's correct. What's amazing is, uh, I believe it's Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13 speaks about Yeshua in the synagogues, okay? You guys remember this one, right? And there was a woman there who, who, you know, withered hand or something, she was deformed, and Yeshua on Shabbat healed this woman, okay? And all of the rabbis went, yay, she's healed. All the rabbis got all kinds of upset because he healed on the Sabbath, right? You guys know the story? And then Yeshua starts talking to one of the leaders, and he's like, don't you... Don't you even unwrap or unstrap your animals from the manger and take them out to be watered? Why did he say that? What if they said no? Could they have said no? Another interesting thing is this word, in. 
So when we see in, we automatically think of the Hilton, right? So this word in here, Cataluma, sounds right, Cataluma. And it literally means a lodging place, generically, a guest chamber, an inn, or a guest room. As opposed to Luke chapter 10, verse 34, it uses the same, uh, it uses a different Greek word for inn when it's talking about the Good Samaritan. They took him to an inn. That was a hotel. That was a paid establishment where you have rooms that you rent. Different word. This word means something else. This word literally means a guest chamber. Now, I don't know what slide I had next. There we go. So, according to a book, Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes, um, cultural studies in the, in the Near East, from what they've discovered in first century lodging in ancient Israel, typically poor houses were one room, okay? One room. You guys have this concept now, right? <laughs> one room. You walk in, right? And you have your living room and your bedroom and your dining room all in one room. So when Yeshua was talking about letting your light shine, he says even if you light a candle, it illuminates the whole house because it's all one room. With me? And so what they discovered is they discovered that when you walked in the front door, there was kind of like a ramp, a slope up, and then a few feet higher was where the bed would be, all in the same room, dining area and everything. But they discovered down at the bottom of the ramp were troughs of stone carved into the floor mangers inside the homes. The more they study, the more they realize that in first century poor, leave your animals outside, they might get taken. Plus in the winter, it gets kind of cold. It's not like you have, you know, heating system. So people would bring their cattle inside their homes, tie them up in their living room next to the manger to keep them warm during the winter and also they could sleep near them so they knew they didn't get stolen. Now some houses had a upper room Remember uh, when Yeshua went to the upper room for Passover, right? That same word for in is that same word for upper room. It's the same thing, guest room. So some homes had an upper room or a special detached room. Maybe the son would move into when he got married or guest would stay at, right? That would be behind the house with a separate entryway. As an individualistic culture, we always assume that people are rogue, that people are struggling alone. In the East, it was the mother's family that was typically responsible for the midwifery services. We always think Mary just huffed it and popped the sucker out by himself, right? Everybody had midwives. Who was with Mary and Joseph? In the city of David, the city of their family? It was their family. They weren't alone. So what most scholars believe nowadays is that Yeshua was born in a living room of a home, right? Remember when the angels went out for the shepherds? They told the shepherds, listen guys, the Savior's been born, the Messiah's been born. And so it says they went in and they found the manger with Mary and Joseph and Yeshua and they went back out and they rejoiced. They were so happy. Why were they so happy that their Messiah was born in a manger? Because that's most likely the same place they were born, the lowly of all. So further evidence here. Yeah, William Thomas, Thompson, uh, it is my impression that the birth actually took place in an ordinary home of some common peasant and that the baby was laid in one of the mangers such as are still found in the dwellings of farmers in that region. This quote's about 100 years old. So EFF bishop, perhaps recourse was held to one of the Bethlehem houses with a lower section provided for the animals with mangers hallowed in stone being reserved for the family. Such a manger being immovable, filled with crushed straw would do duty for a cradle. An infant might be left in safety, especially if swaddled when the mother was absent on temporary business. Wrap the baby up, stick it in the manger, walk out, go shopping, come back. Now it makes sense to a first century reader. And guys, check up on this. Check up on this. So if you're a first century, let's say you're a shepherd and you're reading about this Messiah. And she brought forth her firstborn child, wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Why'd they lay him in a manger? Why was he laid in a manger? Oh, because there was no room in the guest room. Most likely it was tax season. Family had other folks in town filled in the guest room. At that point in time, the living room was the obvious place to give birth. There's more room, more resources. Bring hot water in and tongs, whatever you need to give birth. (laughs) 
perfect location with plenty of room, and he was laid in the manger, possibly of someone's living room. Now, this is enough evidence to be a theory, but we still have the hypothesis of a shelter or a cave. But you see, my main point of talking about this so much, they were in the city of David. Their relatives were there. They didn't give birth to Yeshua alone. But as an individualistic culture, we have no concept of that. We wouldn't even assume that, right? Because by default, we focus on individuals being rogue, being rebellious, being apart from the crowd, being strong individually. They didn't need their family. That's why their family wasn't mentioned, because they were alone. That's how our minds work. I had all kinds of folks with them. It's a joyous event. In antiquity, another sacred cow. <laughs> Teamwork and cooperation was the norm, especially for ministries. Paul always worked with a team. You guys realize that? Raf Shaul always worked with a team. Uh, in Acts 15, 36 through 41, uh, Paul and Barnabas split up. He lost his teammate. Paul didn't move until he found another teammate. Not even gonna continue ministering to people. Nope, I need a team to do this, right? Luke records that after that Paul does not even begin working in Corinth, right? Corinthians, first and second. Corinth, until after becoming part of the community alongside Aquila and Priscilla, and implicitly being involved with their trade guild. <laughs> All right, now we can start ministering in Corinth. We have a team. We have this great perk, benefits. This is gonna be easy. We work together on this. When it was time to discharge a letter, how many of you guys realize that 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, people didn't just write letters and send them off like we do today? Right? Anyone work in a hospital or maybe for a doctor? Do doctors write their own reports? If they are made to, they're very upset. Typically, doctors have what's called a transcriptionist. Saves them time, saves them energy. They talk into a microphone. Either they have a software that transcribes their information or the recording gets sent to a co-author that listens and types. This is how a majority of letters were written, at least in Greek culture in the first century. Most likely, this is how all of the gospels were penned. Matthew, per se, speaking to a transcriptionist. And this is what happened, writing it down. Paul, same thing, except for with team members, you have a whole team. So imagine Paul writing a letter to Corinth and he gets his whole crew together. Okay guys, we're a team, right? What do you guys think we should write? I mean, I'll pin it, I'll put my name on it, but I need your guys' input. Can you imagine collaborating with five other people, writing one letter. It seems wise because we know all the junk that was going on in Corinth, right? Sexual immorality, all that mess, right? Bodies, temple of the Holy Spirit. You imagine Paul saying, okay, here are the issues we're having. What do you guys think? How should we tackle this issue? And everyone's giving input and they're coining the letter with everybody being involved with it. Such a foreign, foreign concept to us. That's how letters were written. In other words, what I'm saying, is for the most part, Paul most likely did not write 100% of all of his letters. Probably a small fraction of what he actually contributed. He approved it. Matt, that's, that's fine, that's history, but can you prove that in scripture? Yeah, check this out. Six of Paul's letters indicate that they were written by co-authors in the first verse. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.1, I, Paul, along with Sophenus, write to you. 2 Corinthians 2, 1. I, Paul, along with Timothy, write to you. <laughs> Galatians. We wonder why Galatians is so confusing. He doesn't even name everyone who's involved with writing the letter of Galatians. He says, <laughs> Paul and all the brethren that are with me right now are writing to you. <laughs> 20 guys in a room. No, we need to, no, this law, no, this law, no, no, we need to tackle this issue. No, we need to tackle this issue. 1 Thessalonians 1 through 2. How many of you guys never realized that? I never realized that. I mean, I mentioned it. I've always read past it, but these were co-authors. That's why Paul mentioned them in the front of the letter, the introduction. 
Paul's missionary efforts were always a team effort. Why? Because it was not about him. It was about getting the kingdom to work as a kingdom to move the kingdom forward. In the West, we are taught that the focus should be on individual decisions of faith. Which is true. In the West, we're taught about individualistic salvation is the focus, which is not wrong or right. I'm not saying that, but I want to paint a picture of the cultural differences, okay? Here, we're taught that I'm saved. It's about my relationship with Jesus, my relationship with Yeshua, my relationship with God. I'm going to heaven. I'm not going to hell. 2,000 years ago, it was an individual decision that you made to join the group. We are saved. We are the kingdom. Right? You see the difference? So check this out. So, so Yeshua clearly states that it is an individual decision, and I'm not gonna, I don't want you guys to take away from this. Matt's saying it's not an individual decision. It, it, it is. You have to make that choice. But look at this. See, so even Yeshua says this in Luke 14, 26. If any man, any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and his wife and his children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. So in an individualistic culture, that's controversial. Imagine in a collectivistic culture... <laughs> Where your family is like group effort. What? <laughs> Yeshua was a revolutionary. He said a lot of controversial things. This is one of them. Makes you uncomfortable reading stuff like that, doesn't it? I hate my mother and father. What are you talking about? In non Western cultures, um, what this author was reading uh, about some Asian friends that he had doing mission works, and even in Indonesia. He would approach an individual talking about the faith in Jesus or the faith in Yeshua, and they would have to go home and talk to their parents whether that was a good decision for them to make or not. We can't imagine that. It's your decision to make. No, I mean, it's a community decision whether I go in this faith. If my father says that Yeshua is, is the best uh, one to serve, if he's gonna be the master, then I know it's the right decision because my parents know best. It's why it's such a big deal, the missions work that's going on in China. It's a hard nut to crack, folk. <laughs> That's a tough thing. And people in China who are devoting their lives to Messiah, it's a big deal. It's not like here where like your parents aren't believers and then you become saved and oh, it's kind of awkward. Over there, it's disownment or death. That's why. So it is an individualistic uh, decision, but check this out, okay? So you guys remember when, when Paul is in jail? Right? And they got that big earthquake and all the cells open up. You know the story? We can read the story. So Acts chapter 16, verse 29, if you want to follow along. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came twin, tr trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. So Silas and Paul were in prison and the earthquake came and all the lights went out and the doors opened and the prison guard woke up and he saw all the gates were opened. And he was ready to kill himself. He was like, oh no, my prisoners are set free. What am I gonna do? Pulls the sword, ready to do it. And that's when Paul comes out. Hey, God, <laughs> it's okay. We're still here. So prison guard now feels obligated to them. So he comes in trembling and brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Your faith that you have, what must I do to be saved? Paul says, well, you need to say this prayer and you need to ask Jesus into your heart and then you will be saved. Close, close. They said, believe on the master, Yeshua Messiah, and you will be saved, you and your house. The house, what does that mean? And they spoke unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them that same hour of night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all of his, straightway. And when he brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God and all of his house. This same type of thing happens in Acts 10, verse 2, 11, 15, 14, 16, 15, 18, 8, um, where people and their whole households become saved in an instant. Now, it wasn't like, you know, one guy got saved and by default his family was saved. The concept is that the leader of the household went into his house and told his family, listen, guys, I got something to tell you. And the family, because they were dependent on the decisions of their family, their household, 
okay, Dad, we trust you, we're saved, we're all in. It's just what the context of Scripture is. In the West, family is defined typically by our immediate close family, right? I mean, we have our mama, papa, brothers, and sisters. Outside of that, it's like little lesser, lesser uh, family ties. You know, our cousins, they're not as big as family as our mom and dad are, of course. They're still our family by default. But in the West, outside of our house, we begin to lose track of who our family is, right? Just because someone has the same last name doesn't mean they're our family, right? In the East, culturally, it's defined by bloodlines. So if someone has the same bloodline as you, no matter how far out their household you are, equal family. You go into Bethlehem, the city of David, everybody's family, right? Once in a family, your life, your duties, and your expectations are defined for you as part of that family. So Yeshua was defined by his household, the son of Joseph, the carpenter. <laughs> and non the non-West definition of family is much broader than the East. But Yeshua actually took it a step further. See, for Yeshua, family, was not just about bloodlines. This is the part I get excited about. For Yeshua, family was extended to everyone who was knit together with him in the faith. Talk about a big family. Not a Western type family where we start to, you know, cousins are estranged a little bit or, or even siblings when they move out, you don't really talk to them that much anymore. No. In the East, everybody was close if they were your family. Remember in Matthew 12, we have it up here. Yeshua is starting his ministry and he's causing all kinds of trouble. He's stirring it up quick, man. And finally, he's sitting with his disciples and his mother comes with all of his brothers and sisters. You guys remember this incident? And he stretched forth his arms and they're, they're outside, they're banging. They're, Yeshua, come home, get out of here. You're shaming us, right? They cared about him, come on. Your brothers and sisters and your mother is out here. Get outside right now. And what Yeshua do? He's sitting around his fellow believers, disciples and such. And he extends his hand forward toward his disciples and says, behold, my mother, my brethren. <laughs> and whosoever should do the will of my father, which is in heaven, the same as my brother, my sister, and my mother. That was unheard of. Redefined family to a whole new level. Literally, you guys are like my mother. You guys are like my brothers and my sisters. Tightly knit together in the faith. Extreme collectivistic concept. I love this because in Romans 10, we're familiar with Romans 10, and I'm not gonna try to go on too many rabbit trails. I just wanna really get to verse 26. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters. Notice how Paul uses that family terminology a lot. You notice that? Hey, brother, hey, sister, brothers and sisters. So that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. In this way, all of Israel will be saved. That's the point. Everybody gets saved. Not just you, not just me, but the effort is for everybody. Paul continues using family terminology throughout all of his letters, right? He claims that all of the recipients of the faith are his sons. You read that? My beloved sons and daughters. His workflow for a fellowship was defined in family terms. Um, Thinking in Titus and Timothy and so on. Paul continues, oh, uh, Titus 5.1. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. And the younger men as brothers. This is the people he was talking to. To a culture that accepted this idea of family the elder women as mothers. They buy in here. There's a woman older than you. By default in the faith, they should be considered your mother. Men, fathers. On the same age, brothers, sisters. 
the younger sisters with all purity. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becoming set apartness and holiness, not false accusers, ladies. Aged ladies. Not false accusers, not given to too much wine, being teachers of good things. Why? Because you're the mothers. You're setting the example. That they may teach the young women to be sober, love their husbands, and to love their children. It's your role in, not the fellowship, in the body. That's your role. According to what Paul's workflow is, his wisdom. Older men, right? Aged men. Young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded. In all things, showing yourself a pattern of good works and doctrine showing them corruptness, gravity, and sincerity. This is what the older men's job was to impress on the younger men as fathers unto sons. Supposed to raise them up, right? In Paul's model, a believing fellowship, the young would learn from the older, typically, you guys got the wisdom. You have the life experience. You've been through it. I hadn't been through everything. <laughs> the younger have not been and been exposed to what you have been exposed to. The younger have still an opportunity to stumble in their faith just based on what their road ahead of them is, and they need your help. Older women, older men. That's your job, at least according to Paul is to be a support system and to teach and to give a heads up to younger men, listen, life is gonna get rough. It looks like you're fixing to hit a speed bump. Brace yourself. Remain stable, remain sober-minded. Don't corrupt yourself just because of a little accident. Keep moving forward and it will be okay. You have this hope of the faith. Do we do that with each other? I don't think we do. I don't think we do. Why? Because it's all about me. <laughs> It's all about me. And yeah, you're a believer and you're part of the fellowship and so, you know, we'll go to the park afterwards and we'll hang out and tell me your problems. Guys, we're supposed to lean on each other. It's not something we do. And it's not necessarily our fault, it's the culture we live in. But maybe some things in our culture and our mindset need to change. I'm not saying an individualistic culture is wrong by any means. It's how we're taught, that's how our society runs, but we need to understand when scripture's talking about this kind of stuff that it's not about you. Oh, we're good, we got some more. <laughs> Prior to the Great Awakening, um, in the 1730s and 40s, the church was much different, okay? Specifically in Puritan New England. Um, when I say that, guys, I'm gonna say church, sometimes it's a bad word, it's just what we define uh, the generation that we're in and how fellowships come together, okay? Christianity um, has evolved since the first century, right? It sprouted a third arm just in the third century, <laughs> you know, just started evolving all over the place. And the way that the church has pretty much evolved to what it is today in our culture, Christian churches, Sunday churches, has been defined of the social changes and the culture that changed. And so what the church did to reach people is it adapted to the demands of society. I don't necessarily disagree with that. I, I mean, it's how you reach people, right? Um, and so, in, at least in New England at this point, um, the idea of infant baptism was really, really strong, okay? And so when an infant was born, you would baptize them, okay? And um, did not necessarily mean they were saved, it meant they were part of the community, though. They were known as uh, the children of the covenant until they were old enough to confess their personal, uh, their personal conversion, their personal testimony of their faith in Yeshua. And at that moment, that's when salvation was really, you know, lock is around the, the thing, but then it gets locked in, right? But around the 1740s, people began to rebel because society was changing, right? A lot of people think that the Great Awakening was the precursor to the revolution with England. People just getting agitated. I don't wanna be held down by any type of dogma. And so people did not like the idea of infant baptism because they felt like it promoted a false sense of security, right? Which in reality, it probably didn't, but that's just how it was viewed. And so people broke off. They broke off and they started new denominations where infant baptism was really shunned and adult baptism was the only way to get into that church, right? 
So as an adult, you come, and as soon as we see you get baptized, then you're in. Until that point, no. Begin to shift a little bit, right? Many denominations sprouted from that, like we have today. I think I just went through the whole next slide. Yeah, it was the responsibility after an infant was baptized. It was the responsibility of every single adult in that church to raise, rear, and train that child. That's not something we do here. I mean, not our kids. <laughs> mess with them. It's not our children. Not our responsibility. But at least in the 1700s, the way Christianity was designed, at least here in, in the north, they're children of the covenant. There are children now because we're all part of the same body. Collective effort. You see? Come yeah, on. Come on. I ran through all my slobs. So members left the old church and joined new churches that required adult baptism only, not forced infant baptism. And the church had a new entry. You see, before, if you were baptized as an infant, you were raised in the body, right? And so you knew what your role was because that's where you were raised in. You entered in, and that's what your role was. So later, after this grafting out, if you will, of traditional things where things were done, adult conversion only, no forced baptism, things became more of a choice, an individual choice at that point. It was your choice whether you wanted to go to church, whether you wanted to enter the faith. It was your choice by individual choice as an adult, my way, apart from outside influences, apart from how my parents raise me, apart from how my family encourages me, it's my choice whether I want to join this church or not. And with that same choice, I can leave that church. They became part of this group, but their identity was not determined by the group. That was the big shift that happened in the Great Awakening. Did you catch that? Let me repeat it. 1700s, your identity from birth was a child of the covenant. Now you could leave that later on. It was more difficult to do because of the collective pressures that were on you. But your identity was a believer from birth, whether you could confess it or not, by default, people viewed you as part of the body. Now in America, because we're all about free speech and free choice and dag nabbit, we're rebels and dag nabbit, individualistic, we, we don't like that. We, we shouldn't be pressured to do something. I don't agree or disagree, I'm just giving you history. It was after this, when people started breaking away from that concept, that people began being a part of Christianity and stopped identifying themselves with Christians, with Messianics, as a part of the body. Since then, the church has only further evolved in confusing West and non-West culture with doctrine. If we're not careful, our individualistic assumptions about the faith can lead us to think that fellowships such as this, that maybe the faith altogether is nothing more than a social club, a gym, a health club maybe, With the gym, you might sign up for six months or a year, and you get a little card, card carrier, and you go to the gym, sometimes every day, sometimes not, <laughs> once a week, bloop, right? Scan your card as you walk in, and you're a member, and you're a part of the health club. But one day, you don't want to join anymore, you don't want to be there anymore, so what do you do? You just check out. Don't want it anymore. That concept was never biblical at all, at all. When you became a believer, it was a permanent statement and you were now a permanent member of the body. I'm not talking about once saved, always saved. That was just a, no, that's not even something we're gonna discuss today. I'm talking about your identity. It was never meant to be temporary. It was never meant to be something that expires when you get tired of it but that is something we push in an individualistic culture. When my expectations, my expectations, my services are not met. How many of you heard this? I'm not being fed anymore, right? People leave the faith, church hop, whatever. It wasn't about being fed. This, this fellowship is not about me yakking for an hour every week. 
I hope you don't think that. <laughs> it's about this coming together. It's about what happens this afternoon. It's about what happens tomorrow, the next day, the next day, the next day. It's about being a family, talking to each other throughout the week, leaning on each other. It's about strengthening the body and figuring out what is our goal. Not my goal, what is our goal collectively. No matter how boring Matt gets. It's about you guys coming together as a family and not looking for an excuse to cancel your membership away from each other. It's what it was always about. Biblically, oh, we already read all that. Yeah, biblically, when we come into the faith, we are permanently and spiritually a part of the body. Um, Ephesians 2.19 talks about we become the family of God. I hope that term family may mean something a little bit deeper now since we went through all those nice examples. We don't choose who else is a believer, but we are committed to them as believers. That's another thing that we really, we really love to do in Christianity and Hebrew roots a lot is we view someone and we don't like them, therefore they're not in the covenant anymore which cancels our membership card with them so we can be independent from these people and we don't have to deal with them. They don't believe what I believe about this verse. I don't care what you believe about this verse. What is our goal? Right? There's people I don't like. I'll admit that. There's people I don't like to hang out with. I don't want to be around. But I'll still fight for them because they're my brothers and sisters. War ever came against them, I'll fight with them. When a fight's over, I don't know, okay, have a nice life, but it's my job to be committed to them. It's my job to be committed to them. Personality conflicts exist within the body, it's okay. Paul talks about that, we're gonna read about that in just a second. Just because you don't like someone else does not mean that you have a right to amputate yourself from the body or amputate them from the body. Anyone know who Anne Rice is? She's a great writer. I started writing Christian books, I think about 1991, 90-ish. She wrote, uh, uh, I guess, the, the, the book that turned into the movie Interview with a Vampire, really popular in the 90s, Brad Pitt, Tom Cruise, all those guys. Um, so she was the writer of that. And in 2001, she made this Facebook post. Individualistic culture at its prime for those who care, and I understand if you don't, today I quit being a Christian. I'm out. I remain committed to Christ, as always, but not to being Christian or to being part of Christianity. It's simply impossible for me to belong to this quarrelsome, hostile, rampant, angry group of people who have no mercy this is her feelings, who have no mercy, who don't care about others the way that she thinks they should. To this infamous group, for 10 years I've tried and I've failed and I'm an outsider and my conscience will allow me nothing else. Individualistic culture totally makes sense. She got a bunch of likes, 1,500 people. Because that's what America's about. America's about being independent and making a choice outside the group. So I'm still, I'm still committed to Christ, but not to the body, is what she's saying. That's never an option in Scripture, guys. Never an option. But Matt, what if the body just, I don't like the body? Then you try to help it. You don't quit it. Never once, ah, oh, Sorry holding back. Anne wanted <laughs> to establish her own identity as a Christian apart from the entire body of Messiah. If she did not like something about the body, she will just rely on her own faith, and that's it. That works, because it's all about us and our faith in Messiah, right? Too many times we reflect the same attitude, you know. If we disagree with something, we leave. We do not like someone, we leave. We see complicated lives that it's our job to be a part of and support and to help. Ah, we leave. Completely unbiblical. You guys know Messiah? 
Um, he's praying for his disciples right before his crucifixion in John 17, and he has this outspoken prayer. You can, you can hear his tears. My prayer is not for them alone. He's talking about his disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. So he's talking about his disciples, and he's saying, Father, instill in them the courage and the message that you've instilled in me so that they can go out. And I don't only pray for them, but I pray for the ones who are saved, who are in covenant with you because of their message. Yeshua prayed for you. That's you, verse 20, that's you. I don't pray for them alone, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Messiah prayed for us, that's awesome that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe they one, so they can affect the world, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me and they may be one as we are one, I in them, you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity, then the world will know that you sent me and I have loved them even as you have loved me. Messiah said that unity would be a sign that God sent Yeshua here. Unity. Knit together as brothers and sisters. We fight, we deal with each other, but we're family, bonded by the Spirit. Huge message. Isaiah 43, seven, do you know why you were created? I was created to live my passions and to live my life and to do the things I wanna do and to meet my goals. Isaiah 43, seven, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for their glory, oh, sorry, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Isaiah 43, seven says that you were created to support God's glory, not yours, not your interests, not your goals, God's glory. In other words, you were created to support God's kingdom and his reign on earth. It changes things, because in America, we're taught, we need to, our faith is kind of like on the back burner of priorities. We never admit that, that's taboo to admit that, but it's, all, it's a reality. I mean, that's what I'm taught. You know, you go to corporate America, you work, 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 work. That's your priority is to get money so you can have the things that you want so you can pay your health insurance or support your family. And then if you have time for it to fit in, your faith can come into play. And, and hopefully you can find a way to overlap them, but your faith never really becomes the priority. No one else, no one else, just me. I'm the only one who's experienced that. One in the back, two of us, all right. That's the reality of living in this culture we're forced to prioritize things differently than what we should. God says you were created for his glory. Why is it so difficult to make that a priority? Because everyone else who's a believer was created for the same purpose and now we're working towards the same goal and we're individuals, <laughs> we're not a team. Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's why you were created. Our purpose in life, our purpose of being born, our purpose for the things that we do is to further his kingdom, period. Jobs are important, they pay the bills, but we're all sitting here today because we are born with that same purpose. We're all sitting here today because we should have the same goal. We're all sitting here today because we were made and we were knit together in each other to form his kingdom and to further it. Check this out, it's the whole point of a Grace Anatomy, it's the name of this series. For by grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. But it's about me. <laughs> but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Messiah we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each one of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith 
If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then encourage one another. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, then do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, then do it cheerfully. Scripture was written to a collectivistic nation, a collectivistic culture, for one purpose, and that is to work together, not with individualistic views, but to serve one another. What that means, that means that your life, throughout your life, you should be looking for ways to support the kingdom, okay? With your time, with your money, with all of your efforts. That's the point that you're made, okay? Whether it's volunteering here, we could always use help with kids class, or whether it's volunteering for another ministry, it should be a priority in your life. How can I spend my time helping further the message of Yeshua? If it's money, support something, please. As believers, in Acts, I was gonna throw in the part in Acts where it talks about all the believers came together and nothing was their own. Took all their money, poured it in a pot. Here, it's for everybody. <laughs> Cars, houses, everything's for everybody. But that, that, I felt like that would be a little much uh, for, for 2015 here in the West. Guys, if you don't currently support, financially support a ministry of some kind, I would encourage you to find one to support. I'm biased, I fit. But if not fit, then someone else. Don't hoard your money and keep it from reaching others in the kingdom. That was something I had to learn. I don't want to give them my money. I don't want to give them my money. I always made up excuses where I was going to send my money. It's easy to do. I haven't found the right ministry to sow my seed yet. Guys, it's not yours to keep. It should be an effort just to give it away. Just get it out. <laughs> so you can mark it off your list. Find some way to sow into the body, whether here or someone else, somewhere else. Sow it somehow. Lots of ministries online. Don't make excuses not to participate in furthering the kingdom. With your time and effort, we'll hook you up with some volunteer jobs here. Children's class, teen class, cleanup, whatnot. Homeless shelters downtown. Find some way to contribute. Find some way to link arms with each other and show the world that you're making an effort with the time that God has given to you here to move forward and you're not alone in doing it. No one was meant to be an individual in God's kingdom. No one. Especially you. Resources if you're interested for where I got this information. We miss the purpose of our lives when we focus on ourselves. Take away nothing else. Matt, that was a great history lesson, yada, yada. Your life is not about you. It's about us. It's about furthering the kingdom together. It's about being a part of the kingdom. Anne Rice, she wants to break off and rebuild her own version of God's kingdom. There's no her version Anyone who confesses Messiah with their mouth and believes in the heart that God raised him from the dead, guess what? I mean, whether they're saved or not is regardless. They got the name tag, they're in. You're committed to them one way or another. And it's your job to reach them. It's your job to help them. It's your job to encourage them. And it's your job to join arms with them and walk forward with that. We see a trans uh, we're seeing a transition even in Hebrew roots uh, fellowships and ministries right now where ministries are working together with each other some may teach one thing about this verse or that on that verse, but we're coming together as a unit to walk forward. You guys know I do a broadcast with Rico, Ryan, Taylor, and Daniel, right? Five, four or five different ministries. We do a broadcast every Wednesday night, and you don't see us talking throughout the week. We disagree on stuff. We do. Sometimes it's big stuff, sometimes it's small stuff, but we all, re we all remain focused on what the purpose is. The purpose is to reach people and to edify the body. So we come together on Wednesday nights with a collective message saying, okay, this is what we want to encourage people with and encourage the body with. It's not a one-man show. Never should be. 
If it is, something's wrong. Something's wrong. I brag about the fellowship a lot here. Um, Because I've never met a Hebrew Roots Fellowship where someone could invite their Sunday church friends to come. (laughs) And they actually come in and they enjoy it and they don't feel shunned right off the bat. And when I'm telling people I'm, I'm bragging about the Fit Fellowship and everyone's like, yeah, you're doing a great job, Matt. And I'm like, that's not because of me. That's because of the fellowship. That is y'all's effort. What this fellowship is, is what you guys have put into it. And I'm so thankful for that. You guys have no idea. Keep doing it. Let's walk this fellowship forward together. Let's continue putting into this ministry. I would love to be able to reach more people with Yeshua and with the gospel of the Torah. We have that ability if we work together and we move forward together, put our energy into supporting this fellowship and supporting each other. A collective effort. It was never supposed to be about you being saved. Sorry. It was always supposed to be about restoring the kingdom and us being saved.